Uh, I'm going to turn uh, the program over to uh, Dr. Kevin Baker. He's going to make a short presentation on the uh, use of cannabis. He has 1,500 patients in Hawaii. He's uh, board certified in cannabinoid medicine. We'll have also Dr. Lee Porter, a uh, nurse practitioner. Uh, ben Scales with the blue tie, the author of our bill. And we have Mike Kravitz again, who will take uh, the last questions. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kevin Baco. It's an honor to talk about this ancient herbal medicine that I personally witnessed help so much. So just a little background information uh, on me. I attended EBMS, uh, my medical school, and by the time I graduated in 1995, the last thing on my mind was to become a hot doc. I entered my family practice residency in 1996, finished in 1999, and my medical training has allowed me to work in a variety of practice settings, uh, alternative medicine has always been one of my main interests, but I've worked in prisons, I've done conventional family practice, I've done urgent care, occupational medicine. But honestly, I was never really satisfied with my practice until my wife and I opened up our own practice in Hawaii. There's Michelle right there. Um, she's going to come up and say a few words because she offers a passionate perspective um, from the side of our practice that I don't see. When I'm seeing patients, she's in the waiting room talking to them. So um, she'll just uh, have a, a few thoughts to share at the end of this, this talk. Um, what we found in our practice is that we immediately witnessed how prescription pain medications seem to be doing more harm than good, and how people were looking for safer alternatives to treat their ailments. In fact, medical cannabis certifications became our most requested service. So, we shifted our, uh, the focus of our practice to medical cannabis. We currently, as Perry said, have about 1,500 patients. Um, this is me in front of our uh, main office on the beautiful island of Kauai. But we decided we'd like to settle in Carolina. So I got my license uh, to practice here in 2011. Uh, I hooked up with some of these folks and was uh, named the medical director of the North Carolina Cannabis Patients Network. And I've since become board certified, board certified in cannabinoid medicine. There's only a few of us out there, but I believe it's going to be a rapidly growing profession. And what this essentially is, cannabinoid medicine, is a description of how and why cannabis works as a medicine. And this is a system, the endocannabinoid system, that is not taught about in medical schools. I certainly wasn't taught about it um, when I graduated from EDMS, and it's still not taught. So the endocannabinoid system essentially is receptors. We have receptors that react to the plant. It's mo these receptors are most concentrated in our nervous system and our immune system, but they're found literally throughout the body. Here's a little picture of, of one of them. They're called G proteins, for those people who know what that means. You can see right here, there's the cell membrane, and the proteins of this receptor are woven in and out of that membrane, in, outside and inside the cell. There's a 3D picture of it. Now this here, apologies for anti-vivisectionists, but this is a really telling picture. This is a rat brain. And what, these, what, it, what, what it depicts is the endocannabinoid receptors lighting up in that brain. So you can see there are certain areas that are very, it's very concentrated in the brain. There's the cerebellum. And this is an interesting thing too. This is the brain stem. The brain stem uh, is what regulates the majority of the, the basic vital functions. And it doesn't light up there. And this helps us understand why cannabis is such a safe medicine. You can't get poisoned using cannabis. And by the way, all vertebrate animals have the endocannabinoid system. It isn't just humans. So, we're talking about the cannabinoid receptors. There must be a reason those receptors are there. We must make something in our body 
that these receptors are triggered by, and we call them endocannabinoids. Endo meaning it comes from the inside of our body. Here's two of those receptors, two of those endocannabinoids, the two well, most well-known, anandamide and 2-AG or 2 arachidonyl glycerol. The depiction of their chemical structure right there. And these are found in nearly all tissues, including breast milk. So like I was saying, the endocannabinoid system essentially is cannabinoid receptors plus endocannabinoids. The overall function of this system is to maintain healthy physiologic balance, or homeostasis. As uh, this researcher said, the basic function is to relax, eat, rest, forget, and protect ourselves. Those are all pretty important functions. And here is a, uh, a little depiction of how this endocannabinoid system works in the nervous system. That's a nerve, and that's a nerve. All right, the top nerve is signaling the bottom nerve through these little neurotransmitters. There's the receptors on the end nerve to basically send that message forward. In the green, these are the endocannabinoids. The receiving nerve is sending these endocannabinoids back to the sending nerve, the signaling nerve. There's the endocannabinoid receptor. And what you have here is a negative feedback loop. So what the endocannabinoid system does is it helps keep our nervous system calmed down. Interesting, this, this uh, process gets suppressed under stress, which may serve a good function. If you have an immediate stress, you want your nerves to be firing full power. But what happens with chronic stress? With chronic stress, we start to break down our, ourselves. This, this basic overdrive of the nervous system starts causing all kinds of events in our organs downstream. Now, this is just in the nervous system. These endocannabinoids uh, are also released from cells throughout the body, including throughout the immune system, where they help with uh, anti-inflammatory functions. And one of the biggest bu buzzes in the, in the, I think in the medical community, it should be, is that these actually will trigger cells that are diseased to die. So endocannabinoids and their cousins from the plant world, phytocannabinoids, kill cancer. And I don't want to say it kills all kinds of cancer, but it does kill certain forms of aggressive cancer, and that deserves a lot of recognition. Okay, so I was saying phytocannabinoids. These also modulate the endocannabinoid system. There's one of my patient's plants who's proud of it. had some fun colors to it. There have been over 60 cannabinoids recognized in the cannabis plant. The two most notable are tetrahydrocannabidol and cannabidiol. Now THC is infamous for its mind-altering effects. And depending on uh, who you believe, it may make it look like this, right? From the old reefer madness propaganda films. Current, current popular, popular culture tends to depict cannabis users as this, right? There's the stoner look. But this is really how I've come to see cannabis users. They're medical cannabis patients. These people come from all walks of life, in all shapes and sizes, all ages. And for historical perspective. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these, these cannabinoids. This here is a little pie chart that has a sampling of some of these cannabinoids and the different functions that they've been found to, to the roles that they play in the body. So, Take a look at this top one, CBD. We mentioned THC, but CBD doesn't get as much attention, uh, but it's getting increasing attention, and it should. Look at the things it does. It treats anxiety, it treats psychosis, it treats uh, seizures, it protects nerves, it 
treats spasms, it helps with heart disease, it's anti-cancer. I mean, the, the list goes on. These are all amazing, amazing functions that I think we all want a little bit of this kind of protection, don't we? The idea here is that, as I was saying, chronic stress, our body's breaking down and our own endocannabinoid system isn't functioning at its optimum. So we supplement it with a plant, we flood the system with some of these cannabinoids that take over the functions and normal state or health can be restored. This helps explain why so many conditions can be uh, effectively and safely treated by cannabinoids. Look at that list there. Now, I was saying that cannabis effectively treats a wide variety of conditions, but this is a powerful medicine. So I feel it needs to be respected as such. That being said, it's one of the safest medicines known to man. This chart makes the point. This here is a, a graph chart of ratios of effective dose to lethal dose, okay? So look at cannabis up at the top. So if an effective dose for a patient was, let's say, one cannabis joint, they'd have to smoke 20,000 cannabis joints for it to even possibly kill them. And this has never happened because nobody's ever died from cannabis, right? I don't think it's possible to do this, right? But, but compare some of these other drugs. Look at over-the-counter aspirin, one out over 200. So, if for the person who takes an aspirin a day, if they take a bottle of 200, that could kill them. Look at Prozac, antidepressant. One bottle of 100 could kill the person. Look down here, alcohol. One out of 10. So if a person, the effective dosage for their medicinal alcohol, a double, you know, a double shot, if they took 10 of those double shots, that could kill them. This is another a graph that I think is really interesting. This is data from the FDA. It's their Adverse Events Reporting System. So check it out. These are deaths and serious outcomes from FDA-approved drugs. Year 2000, 19,000 deaths. Look how those numbers rise and rise and rise and rise. 2010, 82,000. That's a fourfold increase. That's pretty amazing and pretty scary if you think about it. Look at this. 10 years, 10 years, 450,000 people died. How many people have died from cannabis? Zero. Yes, zero. Okay, so cannabis is not addictive. It is. Cannabis is non addictive. Now, some people will say, well, it's habit forming, isn't it? Yeah, but so is Facebook. Let's keep this real. <laughs> I know a lot, a lot of the uh, legislators here are going to have concerns about the risk to public safety. But it's a very low risk compared to other risks. By far, whether we get this legislation in Carolina this year or not, the most dangerous, I should say, the most dangerous thing to cannabis users is the criminal justice system. Yeah. It still happens to my patients in Hawaii. We still have to deal with it. Although, I will tell you that I have seen it myself mellow. And that, that is very encouraging. There's also a black mark, mark issue. I mean, the reality is, if you get on the wrong side of the criminal justice system, it's going to seriously, negatively impact the quality of your life. So, another concern is kids. You've got to protect the kids and their developing nervous system. That's a good ideal. The issue is that very little research has been done on the effects of kids. But what research has been allowed seems to only be positive. It actually helps treat many disorders more safely and with less side effects, just like us adults. And when you start comparing cannabis risks with 
look at all the other risks in, in, in our world. I mean, do we really know what effects violent video games have on a developing nervous system or being on a cell phone all the time or smartphones? Other issues like vaccination, fluoridation, these are things that have been shown to actually have negative health impact. Cannabis really hasn't shown that. What about drugs like Ritalin? Cannabis should be the least of our worries. Okay, another big concern to public safety is road safety, all right? There's a tendency to compare drunk driving, uh, basically the cannabis impairment to drunk driving. But unlike alcohol, cannabinoid levels don't equate with driving impairment. If the true issue is impairment, then it makes more sense to regard it really the same way that we regard prescription medications. The bottom line is you shouldn't drive when you're impaired, right? Or when you're super tired. That's probably more dangerous than driving on, driving on cannabis. Okay, so legalization. It's been legalized in 18 states so far, and the District of D.C. provides protection for patients, caregivers, and us physicians from state prosecution. Definitely the laws vary from state to state, even county to county. So some of my experiences with Hawaii was the first state to legalize medical cannabis by act of state legislature. And that's what we're going to have to get through here in Carolina. It's easier to get these sorts of bills passed when there's just a public referendum. Here we have to encourage our representatives to take a stand. Now in Hawaii, the population is about 1.4 million. There's about 12,000 registered patients. So that's a little less than 1%, which is fairly typical of states. So what can this kind of legislation do uh, for a state? It definitely puts patients at ease because they're backed by law when they're medicating. They can cut back on their prescription medications, and that eliminates all the dangerous side effects, and pleasant side effects, and the cost. Patients can regain their function, uh, either around the house or at work. Many say it literally gives them their life back. One thing I've seen is that the stigma breaks down. People using and growing cannabis no longer need to hide from their family, friends, and children, and bosses. Another important issue, as I was mentioning, is police mentality lights up. Takes a little time, but cannabis shifts from the point of intimidation and criminal activity to a state protected privilege. Add this to the removed threat of incarceration and criminal records and broken families. This makes a lot of difference. Also, what you see with this legalization is an increased availability of trustworthy, higher grade medication. And especially when you can grow it yourself, you know what's going into it. What it doesn't do, okay, this bill is not going to change federal law. It may, you know, further the conversation, but it's not going to change that, that stance. And one of the, the positive things about this is that the current administration does have a general policy that they will make it their lowest law enforcement priority as long as patients are complying with the, with the state medical cannabis law. There's going to be some folks that are going to remain dead set against this. Doesn't matter if it's legal or not. But being legal does make a lot of difference. I swear my grandma was so against it when I was growing up. And uh, she's in California. Yeah, I was surprised I was talking to her about what I do in Hawaii. She says, oh yeah, it's legal here, you know. I don't want to use it, but she, 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 was, she thought it was a great thing because she saw how it helped people and it was legal. It makes a lot of difference for her. Okay, society is not going to break down here. North Carolina isn't going to turn into a drug den. Basically, life's going to go on uh, as it does already. I don't believe the public is going to really be made any less safe. It doesn't make roads or workplaces any more dangerous. I've yet to hear any of my patients tell me that they've crashed their car or uh, got into a work-related accident because they were high on cannabis. 
These laws aren't going to necessarily stop employment drug testing, although this current bill does a lot to protect people from this kind of, a, this kind of a corporate activity. Last and most importantly, cannabis is not a cure-all. For many patients, it is their only medicine, but it has its limits. For most, it will not overcome a poor diet, unhealthy living habits, negative attitude, lazy regard to exercise, or unfortunate genetics. So here's a picture of one of my patients. His name's Moses, and you can see he's an artist. But he was paralyzed in a car accident, and he really has to paint, he really has limited function with one of his arms, and has to do the painting with his mouth. But look at that. He said it is literally it has literally given his life back. He can make a living with his art. And he's an incredible life inspiration. Okay, so <coughs> medical cannabis in Carolina. Like I said, 1% is a fairly typical enrollment in most state programs. So if you think that Carolina has about 9.5 million, that's the, the figure that I found, you can expect at least around 95,000 patients enrolled in this program and benefiting from it. So, in conclusion, I feel that North Carolina, this act, will help make Carolina a safer, more helpful, and just environment for all who live within its borders. Thank you very much. I'm going to have my wife just, just have to say a few few words, but as far as concerned that this program might be abused, I wanted to leave you folks with a story. Okay. So once upon a time, there was a town on the shore of a fast-moving river. So dangerous was that river that every year, a number of people died trying to cross it. In time, the townsfolk gathered before their leaders, demanding a bridge be constructed. But the leaders refused. Why not, cried the townsfolk, when a bridge would save so many lives? To which the leaders replied, because people might jump off of it. <laughs> this act is literally a bridge that will save and improve the quality of life for thousands upon <laughs> thousands upon thousands of North Carolinians. Thank you for your time. to you guys today is because I wish that you guys could sit in my chair for one day and get to witness the miracles that I do. I see sick people, desperately sick people, get better. Things that they have not even imagined they could do again, they were able to do. Just using this simple plant. I want you to know that the United States government has known since the early 1970s the anti-tumor and pain-relieving effects of cannabis with scientific proof. Now I want each of you to think about how many people in the last 40 years have suffered excruciating, painful illness, <coughs> disease, and death when our own government has known what is not even just an effective cure, but even at least an effective treatment that could have vastly improved the quality of these people's lives. And I'm sorry, to me, that is inconscionable. It really, truly is. I want you to think about all of your friends and family and neighbors that are suffering from cancer, glaucoma, HIV, AIDS, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, or even muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy is really close to my heart because my first cousin, his name was Daniel, who grew up in Greenville, North Carolina, had muscular dystrophy. This young man suffered from pain that you and I can't even imagine. 
every single day. When he was 13 years old, he, his body started going back into the fetal position. And his parents had to take him to Duke and they had to cut his tendons for him to be able to sit up straight. My cousin passed away a few years ago, and when he did, he was a body of bones with a beautiful heart and a clear mind. I think about how this could have helped him. And though it's too late for Daniel, it's not too late for thousands of others who are suffering this pain. So please, do everything that you can Talk to your legislators, and for you legislators, this is in your court right now. You have the ability to change lives. I beg you, please, do everything that you can. Thank you.